I think my sound is on, so that means we're about to begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a first virtual Nelson Benton lecture tonight featuring the executive editor of the Washington Post, Marty Barron. Um, and a quick thank you as we begin, because uh, our professors, Deb Icott and Lee Meredith, who teaches Media 101 from Gutenberg to Zuckerberg, had the ambition to get Marty um, Barron to come and speak to the class. And I thought that was so fantastic that um, uh, we thought we ought to invite a lot more people to come and listen to him. So a word about Nelson Belton, who this is named after. He was a UNC grad. He won national attention for his uh, coverage of the civil rights movement here in the South and became one of CBS's most respected correspondents during the Walter Cronkite era. He covered everything from civil rights continuing on, politics, the space flight, and his book, his little reporter's book that had his script for the day that uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated is in our display in Carroll Hall. You might want to take a look at that. And I know that he would be very proud that we are hosting Marty Barron tonight because of the brand of reporting and journalism that Marty Barron stands for. He has long been known as a journalist who believes in facts and holding power accountable. He became a national star for many people uh, when the movie Spotlight came out, one of the best journalism movies in my estimation. It's a story of the Boston Globe's investigative reporters who put a spotlight on the Catholic Church's sexual abuse scandal in Boston. It became a national, international, um, uh, really, scandal for the Catholic Church. And Marty Barron was key, a key reason that investigative journalism team was so successful. If you haven't seen it, put it on your Netflix uh, list. And Barron really continues that tradition of strong journalism um, that serves democracy now at the Washington Post. He has given a lot of eloquent speeches in the last couple of years in this time of turmoil for the business. But recently when President Trump began calling reporters the enemy of the people, he was very short in what he was saying. He said, we're not at war with the administration, we're at work. And I think that says a lot. Uh, the extra interest in Marty Barron um, right now is that he's also working at the newspaper that Jeff Bezos bought. Jeff Bezos is known as an innovator and he's got deep pockets. And under Marty Barron and Jeff Bezos, the paper is really thriving. It's more national, it's got more subscribers, it's on video, it's on all levels. And the work is um, really high level. Our plan tonight is to listen to Marty's remarks, then we're gonna bring on a panel of our own students to ask some questions, and then we'll be opening up to you, the larger um, student group who are joining us tonight so that we can really have a give and take. So with no further ado, will you all give Marty a warm Tar Heel welcome. Marty Barron. Thank you very much, Dean King, I appreciate it. Um, Thank you all for inviting me to, uh, to be here with you um, this evening. I, I do regret that our conversation cannot be uh, in person. Um, we're talking tonight about journalism in, in one of the most anxious and polarized times in our country's uh, recent history. Tensions and fractures in our society are really testing support for a free press and for free expression in the United States. Now, this has happened before in our history. The rights we enjoy today were not always secure. We had the Alien and Sedition Acts under John Adams, the Sedition and Espionage Acts under Woodrow Wilson, uh, the McCarthy era. And it really wasn't until the 1950s with Americans witnessing the consequences of authoritarianism in Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan uh, that we began to establish strong and durable protections uh, in court rulings for a free press in this country. Courts came to understand then that an independent press was critical to guaranteeing a, a democracy. The public's understanding about the role of the press in American democracy, however, is eroding today. That is in, in large part because of the unrelenting attacks uh, from the President of the United States. Journalists have been labeled garbage, scum, enemies of the people, traitors. The president has sought to demean us, delegitimize us, and even dehumanize us. He seeks to subvert and suppress independent voices, to shut them up and shut them down. In fact, he has sought to subvert the very idea of objective fact and to demolish the idea that there should be any arbiters of fact independent of his administration 
and its allies. And I'm not just talking about journalists, by the way, but also judges, historians, doctors, scientists, others too. We see that today in the incessant assault on expertise and experience and how hard evidence is ignored and undermined. Traditional news organizations also have been assailed from the left, where they are dismissed as captives of corporate America and hostages to establishment thinking. So this is a stressful time for those of us who work in the media. Now, one reaction to stress and conflict is avoidance. Go quiet, become timid, let fear of confrontation and vilification and denunciation take possession of us. It can also cause us, mistakenly in my view, to question and even abandon the very principles, standards, and practices that have sustained us as a profession and that have contributed to groundbreaking, impactful reporting that brought accountability to the most powerful institutions of government and of society. Fundamentally, we are reporters. That means we should be generous listeners, independent witnesses, investigators of the facts who don't presume that we know it all before we've begun to do our work. And our work, above all, should do the talking. In this moment, it's important to remember that the rights we inherited, including the right of free expression, depend heavily on the willingness of the public to defend them. And to remember that these rights are rendered meaningless unless they are exercised. More than anyone, we in the press have an obligation to exercise our right to free expression. We can never go quiet. Now is a moment for renewed determination on our part. I've said on a few occasions that to be a good journalist, you need both a soul and a spine. A soul meaning you understand journalism's fundamental mission to pursue the truth. Not just understand it, but also feel a deep commitment to it. And a spine, meaning you have the will to withstand the most vicious attacks. A few months back, I was reviewing some materials in preparation for a board meeting of a foundation where I serve on the board of trustees. It's the Knight Foundation, a major funder of journalism, arts, and community programs nationwide. It is funded a lot at your university, including the Knight Chair in Journalism and Digital Media Economics, and current research on the impact of social media platforms on democracy and social political systems conducted by the Center for Information, Technology, and Public Life. The foundation is the legacy of Jack and Jim Knight, two brothers who built one of the largest, most successful, and most respected newspaper companies in the United States. In 1968, at the age of 74, Jack Knight won the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing. It was awarded for commentary expressing his vigorous opposition to the Vietnam War and his support for the free speech rights of anti-war protesters. As I was preparing for that foundation board meeting, I came upon a statement by Jack Knight. In 1969, he gave remarks to a group of business executives and they have relevance today. What he said is this, the quote, unpopular stands taken by newspapers are often the reasons for their preeminence in the field of journalism. The truly distinguished newspapers in this country are those which have dared to face public wrath and displeasure. His instructions for journalists, as he expressed it on other occasions, were pretty simple. It took no more than six one-syllable words to state it. Get the truth and print it. The objective of our profession is not to be popular. The objective of our profession is to get the truth and tell it, just as Jack Knight said many years ago. That is what we believe at the Washington Post. Our principles appear on a wall at the entrance to the Post's newsroom. They were crafted in 1935, and they begin as follows. The first mission of a newspaper is to tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. Now that recognizes that getting at the truth is a process. It is not easy. The truth can be elusive 
And it involves more than facts. It involves context and emphasis and perspective. All of those are required. But the post principles also recognize that there is such a thing as truth. It is not so elusive that it is unknowable. Now there are some things we can say about the truth. It has nothing to do with who or what is most popular. It has nothing to do with your opinion or your political affiliation. It does not depend on who speaks the loudest or who has the most power or who stands to gain. We should recognize and accept that seeking the truth may be unpopular. Being unpopular, however, does not mean we are failing in our work. It may mean we are doing our job and doing it well. The news organizations that wrote honestly and truthfully in the 1960s about racial discrimination in this country were often pilloried for it, accused of sowing discord and dis division. Those that truthfully exposed the lies about our progress during the Vietnam War were subjected to endless invective, accused of being unpatriotic and failing to support our troops. When the Washington Post broke open the Watergate scandal in the early 1970s, President Nixon, along with his aides and allies, portrayed the Post journalists as liars and political opponents. In the end, their reporting was vindicated and ultimately the Nixon administration was held to account for abuse of power, criminal behavior, and obstruction of justice. When the New York Times first published the Pentagon Papers, the secret official history of the Vietnam War, it was accused of treason and threatened with criminal prosecution on the grounds that it had revealed classified information. But what was the government really trying to conceal from the public? How it had deceived American citizens about the war and its progress. In 2003, McClatchy newspapers challenged assertions by the George W. Bush administration that Iraq's Saddam Hussein was developing and stockpiling weapons of mass destruction, the premise for going to war there. But McClatchy's reporters had done their reporting. They had done it right. And they were right. The Bush administration was sending our troops into battle and a seemingly endless war on the basis of exaggerations, falsehoods, and outright lies. We are still in Iraq 17 years later. On perhaps the biggest stories of my career, the news organizations I have led faced suspicion and criticism and condemnation. Still, we went ahead, doing our reporting and publishing what we learned. That was true in 2000 when I was editor of the Miami Herald and using the state's public record laws, we conducted a recount of Florida's presidential election results after the Supreme Court would not allow one would not allow a recount in the contested race between Bush and Gore. Our motives were questioned by Republicans. They thought we were seeking to delegitimize the Bush presidency. As it turned out, we determined that Bush almost certainly won the vote in Florida and won the presidency. No apologies from our accusers were forthcoming. In 2002, when I was editor of the Boston Globe, we exposed a decades long cover up by the Catholic Church of sexual abuse by clergy. A Harvard law professor who would later become ambassador to the Vatican declared that awarding the Pulitzer Prize to the Boston Globe for its coverage would be quote, like giving the Nobel Peace Prize to Osama bin Laden. We were later awarded the Pulitzer for public service and more important, the public won something. It won the truth. Abuse survivors were given a hearing they had long been denied. And one of the world's most powerful institutions was held accountable, finally. And again, in 2013, I was involved in dramatic disclosures that brought harsh attacks on the Washington Post and others in the press. Based on documents leaked by Edward Snowden, our stories revealed that the National Security Agency was conducting surveillance that vacuumed, vacuumed up Americans' information to a breathtaking degree. 
All of Americans' phone call data was swept into a searchable repository. The NSA gained access to vast internet communications. And it was breaking into the main links that connect data centers worldwide. Those revelations transcended particular intelligence sources and methods, the sorts of secrets the press had traditionally withheld from publication. At issue here was a sweeping national policy that dramatically expanded surveillance and drastically eroded individual privacy. That policy raised important questions. Do American citizens get to determine how much privacy they're entitled to? Or does government get to deprive us of our privacy, acting in secret, as long as it can assert national security as its rationale? Our stories and those in Britain's Guardian set off a public debate that had never been allowed to take place about the proper balance between national security and individual privacy. Now, the director of national intelligence and a leading congressman later suggested, chillingly, that journalists who revealed the contents of those documents were Snowden's, quote, accomplices. When the Washington Post and The Guardian in 2014 won Pulitzer Prizes for this coverage, a member of the House Homeland Security Committee said we should have been prosecuted instead. But major technology companies ultimately wrote the president to say the following. We understand that governments have a duty to protect their citizens, but the balance in many countries has tipped too far in favor of the state and away from the rights of the individual, rights that are enshrined in our constitution. And by late 2013, President Obama, although arguing that the Snowden leaks caused unnecessary damage to national security, also allowed that it had led to, an, as he put it, an important conversation we needed to have about how to weigh national security against our right to privacy. And months later, he said, one thing I'm certain of, this debate will make us stronger. For three and a half years now, we've been reporting on the current administration. We believe, we know, that it is our job to hold government accountable. That is the very reason we have a First Amendment in this country. Our work in that regard has brought us savage vilification, day after day, and ominous threats that have required us to invest heavily and enhanced security for our staff. Just yesterday, the president described police violence against, violence against a reporter as, quote, a beautiful sight. No one likes to be attacked by the most powerful person on earth. And we shouldn't have to hear the president of the United States shamelessly inciting violence against us. But none of us in journalism should be intimidated by that either. And none of us should be deterred. We're doing the work journalists are meant to do. So we are going to keep at it. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. I know you'd be hearing the applause right now because that was a very strong speech. It's also full of context was one of the words that you use the reporters have to give putting it in um, not just the last four years, but the experience of a, a life that you've built in journalism that has been through many administrations and challenging power, whatever party, whatever position, but that's the role of journalism. So thanks th for that very much, Marty. I'm going to introduce our students who are going to start the panel. And um, I'm going to start with uh, Sophia Fanning, who is um, one of our first year students and in this Media 101 class learning about the business, probably doesn't quite know what she wants to study yet, but will be challenged by you. And I'm gonna introduce everyone first, Sophia. And um, she brings with her um, great curiosity and was chosen by our professors tonight because she has the first gift of a journalist, even though she doesn't know that's what she wants to be. She asks good questions, so Sophia. Uh, Mary Slade McKee is also um, a first year student and um, 
in our uh, Media 101 class. She's from Greensboro, North Carolina. So far, she is um, thinking about studying film and communication and the role of visual communications is working as a visual design intern for the UNC School of Government. Also with us is John Rutkowiak, uh, which I just ruined your name there, John, sorry. He's one of our student ambassadors and a sophomore in the school. He is uh, right now majoring in advertising and public relations, but is really intrigued by the field of journalism and storytelling in general, and um, wants to explore all the areas that we offer rather than be completely defined as a sophomore. And I, I uh, support that idea. And our last member of the panel is Ruth Samuel, who was, was from uh, Macon, Georgia. I think she now lives here in North Carolina. She's a senior. She is a journalism major. She um, is doing a minor in Hispanic studies. She's a Moorhead Kane. Um, she has written for Teen Vogue and Gothamist and the Indie Week. Her interests really lie in that intersection of race, pop culture, and a lot more. And she is right now the social media editor for the Carolina Association of Black Journalists. And she's also written some very provocative essays for our campus to read for The Bridge, which is a publication, believe it or not, between Duke and UNC. We don't always fight on the basketball court, Marty. We sometimes come together um, on important issues. And Ruth, as our senior, we're going to get you to start us off tonight with the, with the opening questions. Take it away. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much, Mr. Barron, for being here. Um, we appreciate your presence. So I'll just go ahead and get started. So we're in the heat of the presidential campaign cycle, coming off of National Voter Registration Day yesterday, and we are 41 days out from the election. So in recent years, we've seen a 16-year high in hate crimes and white supremacy, the emergence of fringe groups such as QAnon, and this past summer, an onslaught of police violence and police brutality. How do you think newsrooms and journalists, specifically your newsroom, um, should grapple with these topics without falling prey to false balance or both sideism? Well, as I mentioned uh, during my remarks, I mean, I think our job is to get at the facts. I don't. Um, I don't use the word balance. I use the word fairness. Uh, I think it's our job to listen to all people, hear what they have to say, do a really thorough job of research, uh, and like a really thorough job of research, and then tell people what we've really learned uh, in, in the most direct, straightforward, forthright way possible. Um, I think that that's how we really need to think about our work. Um, so. You know, uh, obviously, we need to have adequate resources dedicated to the kinds of subjects that you uh, that you outlined right there. Um, these are incredibly important. They're defining our time. Um, we at the Post have just announced uh, an initiative to actually increase our resources in the coverage of race, ethnicity, and identity. Uh, and one of those areas that we're we're focused, we're hiring an additional reporter in is in the coverage of the administration of justice. Um, and so I think we recognize that this is a surpassingly important subject um, and that we need to cover it from every angle. We need to be out on the street talking to people, uh, talking to as many people as possible. Uh, we need to hear from people who are protesting. We need to hear from people who are, we need to talk to the police as well. Uh, we need to talk to uh, the, the federal government, uh, which is deploying forces in a variety of ways. Uh, we need to talk to, uh, the families of, uh, of individuals who have been killed uh, in the custody of police. Um, we need to talk to everybody and then tell people what we've found. Um, we need to use the power of, uh, of our, our capacity to find um, uh, government documents. Uh, so full-fledged coverage in every possible way for a, one of the major stories of our time. And, um, and it's not a matter of, it's not a matter, I, I don't, I don't, this, this word balance is, I think we need to be, we need to be listeners. We need to be fair. We need to come into stories with our uh, uh, willing to listen to everybody. But ultimately at the end of the day, we need to tell people what we've really learned uh, and tell it to them in the most straightforward, direct um, way possible. Uh, we can't beat around the bush in terms of what we, in terms of what we know. Ruth, you can get a follow-up if you want to push them on something. I don't mind. <laughs> you have to open your mic, though. So with respect to kind of you were talking about newsroom hires and newsroom diversity, um, I know the Neiman Lab was saying that in recent years, the share of Black employees at the Washington Post has declined. 
happen. And so with respect to having efforts to make sure that your newsroom is indicative of the populace that you're serving, the country, um, how do you try and rectify that besides having um, positions in diversity, equity, inclusion, and appointing managing editors and things of that nature? Well, I think that, you know, it's, if it's declined, it declined by a percentage point. I mean, we have, we have actually one of the best diversity numbers in the, in the industry, something like 29% of our overall news staff are uh, journalists of color. Uh, I think at one point we had 30%. Um, and so it, it hasn't declined much. But what, what has happened is that our staff has grown tremendously. Uh, when I came to the Post seven and a half years ago, we had about 580 people in our newsroom, just on the news side. We now have, we're, by the end of this year, we'll have 900. So the actual total number of journalists of color in our newsroom has actually gone up significantly. Uh, the percentage has maybe dropped by, uh, by 1%. Well, where we, have, where we have not done as well as we should, uh, and we, that number can always be better and should be better, and we're working to make it better, uh, but where we have not done as well is that we have not, uh, we don't have a, a, a sufficient number of journalists of color in the absolute most senior ranks of the, of the newsroom. Uh, now, within my first month of arriving at the Post, I named the first black managing editor in the entire history of the Post, Kevin Merida, who's an outstanding person and an outstanding journalist. Um, Three and a half years in, Kevin got a great, a great offer from ESPN to become a senior vice president. Uh, it was a great opportunity for him. Uh, I tried to persuade him that it would be the end of his career if he left, uh, but uh, he saw that it was not going to be the end of his career and he decided to take, the op take that opportunity. Um, but um, we have not done as well since, o but only recently uh, we, we, we did name Krista Thompson as a managing editor for diversity and inclusion. Uh, she is responsible for a lot of important areas now for us uh, and is doing a great job already. And she's been in a job, I don't know, five weeks or something like that. And uh, she'll be responsible for making sure that we do a better job in terms of our hiring. She'll, do, she'll, she'll take the lead in making sure that we elevate journalists of color uh, in, in, in our newsroom. And she is ultimately, she is, has the lead responsibility in our coverage of subjects of, of, um, of race and ethnicity and inclusion. And uh, so, you know, one of the things that we heard from the staff was, look, we're tired of talking about this. We wanna see, we wanna see people doing things, not just talking. And so uh, we immediately set out to take concrete steps to improve our performance in this area. Sophia, I'm going to give you the chance to ask the next question. Um, again, in regards to the upcoming election and especially the 2016 election, um, what are your thoughts about covering the mudslinging that can sometimes occur between candidates? Is it important to cover that or does it maybe take away from important issues that are being discussed? I think we have to cover campaigns in all the respects. They are campaigns after all. Um, uh, it's called politics and people engage in political tactics. And so we need to cover the substantive issues, but we also need to cover the tactics that are being used. I don't think that, you know, just basic name calling is all that interesting, but certainly the tactics on how people are trying to gain an advantage with the voters is something that we, um, uh, something that we wanna pay attention to. We don't pay a lot of attention to you know, what's the, what's the name that uh, Donald Trump used to describe um, uh, Joe Biden today? Um, and uh, that's, that's just not that, that important. The issues are hugely important uh, and we pay attention to that, but you can't look at the issues uh, uh, divorced from the candidates themselves as if somehow there's just issues and that the candidates and their character uh, and their, their base uh, and how they appeal to the public uh, that you can't, you can't just consider that to be irrelevant. I think you have to cover, cover that because that politics actually plays out into policy. Uh, and we have seen that, for example, during the administration of Donald Trump. He started his campaign talking about the Mexican immigrants, uh, describing them for the most part as racist, as, as rapists. And, um, and, and we've seen a, that was a, the earliest signal of the kind of policy that he intended to implement. Uh, during his administration and which he has definitely implemented, which is uh, closing off the borders in almost every respect, not just to, not just to uh, illegal immigration, but to, uh, to refugees as well. Sophia, do you have a follow-up? Do you, do you find um, the, the kind of politics 
something that you want to read or do you sometimes find it something that you find annoying? Um, I definitely think it is um, important for everybody in the United States to be an active member of the political climate and the election. And um, it can definitely be frustrating seeing candidates just kind of name call things like that and kind of feels like it take, takes away sometimes from actual important issues that need to be discussed. But I thought that was a great answer. So thank you. Yeah, and I, I think that if we only see the name calling in the coverage, that's part of why people are turned off. do want to say that um, those of you who would like to ask questions, you can put them in the Q&A. That's the system. And after we have our panel asking questions, we'll be turning to some of yours. So do um, add them uh, as you want. Um, John, I'm going to turn to you next. Thank you. Um, Mr. Barron, in your opening remarks, you talked about the most notable newsrooms being those who have dared to face public wrath in the pursuit of truth. And I was wondering with blame being placed on journalism for the divide in our country and there being massive public distrust in media and an expert opinion like you also touched on, um, as we've seen, especially in the coronavirus pandemic, how do we rectify the relationship between media and the public? And is that a, re a responsibility that falls on journalists and your newsroom? Thanks. I want to give you first the opportunity to correct the pronunciation of your name. <laughs> it is Ratkoviak. The W okay. sounds like a V. <laughs> Thank there you. you go. All right. Um, I should know that, John. I started in Buffalo. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, um, look, I mean, I think uh, declining public trust is certainly something that preceded this administration, but it's been aggravated uh, during the administration. Although, oddly, um, you know, it's actually started to go up in the last couple of years. But what you find is that it's highly polarized. So among Republicans, it's uh, fallen to pathetically low levels uh, and is not, not improved. But among Democrats, it's improved dramatically. Um, uh, and among independents, it's improved modestly um, in the last couple of years. Uh, meantime, trust in the presidency has declined. Trust in Congress continues to be very low. And in fact, trust in just about every major institution in our society uh, with, with really, with the only exception being the military, has really dropped. It, I used to be able to say the military and the police, but the, the trust in the police has dropped as well. So there's a really a, a substantial decline in trust in virtually all institutions in our society, and that is a very risky place to be uh, in a democracy. Um, what can we do? Um, I think that there are some things that we can try to do and some things that we already are trying to do. Uh, one is that I think that we can be more transparent about our methods. Uh, we talk more about, we show more of our documents. We include more uh, actual video and audio of our interviews. Uh, we, we talk about how many people we've interviewed. Uh, we, we just try to be much more transparent about how we actually went about our work. Number two is I think that we can be more transparent about who we are. Uh, there are lots of misconceptions and stereotypes about who works in journalism. Uh, as if everybody came some, from some, you know, Ivy League school and that we all, we all grew up on the coast or things like that. It's just not the case. You know, one of our White House reporters, he grew up on a farm in South Carolina. Uh, we have a, our deputy national editor. She grew up on a farm in, 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 uh, in, in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, we have um, people on our staff who grew up in evangelical households. One, I think, is, is uh, one of nine children. She was homeschooled in an evangelical school and went to an evangelical college. We have, a, we have people who are veterans um, uh, of our recent wars uh, who are working in our newsroom. Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about, about who we are. Thirdly, and I, perhaps most importantly, is that it's really important that we actually get out in the country and talk to all people. Um, so that people see themselves reflected in our coverage in every in every way, um, we have to we have to make sure that we are fully connected to the concerns uh, and aspirations of people uh, in 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 every region of our country and in a variety of professions, and and people when they read us they have to they have to see that we actually we we that we know about them that we are spending time with them that we are listening to them. Uh, that we are reflecting their, uh, their concerns and their hopes. Uh, and uh, we need to do that continuously. Um, will that have an immediate effect? No, none of that. Uh, but I'm trying to think over the long haul. 
The reality is that, you know, the trust in the media has gone up and down over the years. Um, it was, um, you know, uh, it, it, uh, it was low during the Watergate investigation. People had a very poor opinion of the Washington Post and the media. But after that investigation proved to be, it was verified, uh, after people saw that the president really had engaged in a cover-up and engaged in criminal behavior, what was really criminal behavior, then uh, trust, in the, trust in the media soared to record levels. Um, so I try to think about the long run, uh, not just where we are at the moment. And I'm confident that you know, the reporting, the kind of reporting that we are doing at the Washington Post uh, will be validated over the long run. And in fact, it already has been validated in so many instances. So, um, um, so I'm gonna think about the long run here. Thanks, John. That was a good question. Um, Mary uh, Slade, what, what would you like to ask Marty? Hi, Mr. Barron. Um, in our media and journalism one-on-one -on -one class, we recently just wrote essays about objectivity. And I, along with many other students in the class, um, argue that objectivity is a little bit outdated and that we need to focus more on listening to diverse perspectives and truth seeking. So I just wanted to know what your argument would be in favor or against um, upholding the standard of, of objectivity in the wake of recent events. Right. Well, I just gave a speech about a year ago about the need to uh, observe the principles of objectivity. So I think I'm a good person to answer that question. So um, I, first of all, I think that there's an incredible misconception about what objectivity is. Uh, let's remember where that term actually originated. Uh, it originated really with Walter Lippmann uh, in, in a book that he wrote called Liberty in the News uh, 100 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, exactly as a matter of fact. And um, what did he mean by that? He meant that, um, uh, that we all come to our, we approach our work with, we all have preconceptions, we all have our own ideas. But when we approach a story that our, our, part of our job is to set those aside and start listening to people, doing exactly what you're talking about, you know, listening to diverse perspectives, doing what I talked about in my remarks, investigating the facts, um, doing a thorough job of research, and then what he recommended as part of the, this I concept of objectivity is that we not do the, you know, the so-called both sidesism, that we actually tell people what our thorough research had, had, had turned up. What did that investigation, uh, uh, what did we learn from all that work, all that thorough research, and tell it to them in a direct, straightforward, and forthright way, and not pretend that we hadn't done that work. Um, and so, that is a, there's this notion that objectivity means uh, it's everything's 50/50 that uh, you know that it's it's uh, you got always have to say you know uh, this side believes this and but this side believes this regardless of what the facts actually show that is not the concept of objectivity and it's being portrayed as this sort of false balance and that is not what Walter Lippmann had in mind that is not what objectivity is. Objectivity, it, objectivity is merely a recognition that all of us have our own preconceptions and that when we approach something as a journalist, we need to set those aside uh, and, and we need to sort of just do our work, do it thoroughly, do it objectively as if it were almost a scientific experiment uh, and determine what the facts are and put it in context, give it perspective uh, and then tell people what we've, uh, what we've learned with that context context and perspective. Do I think that that's needed these days? Yeah, I absolutely think that's needed these days. Um, am I recommending false balance? No, I'm not recommending false balance. And the concept of objectivity never was, never has been uh, false balance, and it is being misportrayed by, by people who are uh, sailing the very concept of it. I, um, Mary Slade, are, was that convincing to you? Do you? Because I hear all these folks sometimes saying, oh, that's the old fashioned way, you know, objectivity. I, I couldn't have said it as eloquently as Marty Barron does. I don't think, well, we have the values we care on our walls and it is about being impartial. It's about truth seeking, but it's being about objective professionally. Was it convincing to you or do you think there needs to be something new? Well, um, when, I, when I initially wrote my essay, the concept of objectivity in me seem to be upheld by some people as, like you said, um, catering to both sides and, you know, bolstering up both sides and still listening to, like I mentioned, um, I mentioned flat earthers, <laughs> um, listening to a perspective that may 
you know, not necessarily be, I don't know if this is the right word, but valid. So I was going to ask, like, um, if you have any way to redefine objectivity. Um, so I think you did, I mean, that's pretty much what I think is right, just trying to find the facts without any sort of leanings. I mean, I don't want to say that you did not convince me. I mean, that's, I pretty much agree with that, but I think that some people may have different interpretations of what well, I'm, I'm right. And I'm going back to the original concept, which was, does date back to Walter Lippmann and a hundred years ago. And if you go, it's not the easiest read in the world to go read Liberty in the news and some of the other things that he wrote. Um, uh, but, um, but you know, he was an esteemed journalist of his time and one of the leading thinkers of his time. Uh, but that's what he talked about. He talked about, you know, opening yourself up to, uh, is setting aside your preconceptions uh, and and opening yourself up and listening to people and doing a thorough job of research. And if you have a bias, there's only one bias. It's a bias toward the facts. Uh, let the facts tell you what, what is really going on and, uh, and understand the context, understand the perspective. Uh, and when you've done all that, when you did your job, uh, when you did it thoroughly, tell people what you found. Um, you know, it's, um, you don't like as a sci he almost wanted it to be scientific. Uh, when you're a scientist, you do an experiment, you know, you don't say any, and the, the experiment provides you actual results, actual facts. You don't say, well, one theory is this and another theory is that actually one theory actually turned out to be true. And the other theory turned out not to be true. So you tell people what turned out to be true. And that's, that's how we approach our work. And I, it's, I think it's a real shame that the concept of objectivity has been so mischaracterized. We, we believe in it here and we teach it here. Uh, just push you one more time, Marty. So when you do that reporting and the research and you have, have maybe a hypothesis, you come to a conclusion. Coming to a conclusion is not being biased. It's coming to where the evidence takes you, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think you should come to a conclusion. I mean, now uh, there's, always, there's always nuance and there are unknowns. I mean, it's not as if we, we're always gonna know everything uh, and we have to always acknowledge what we don't know. Uh, and when we come to a conclusion, we better, we better be really certain that, you know, that is, that is a proper conclusion. But, uh, the aim is to come to a conclusion uh, about what the, fa what the facts are and tell people that and put it in proper, proper perspective. Okay, I'm gonna now, you don't have to go one to one, but I know Ruth, you're sitting there, I can see your mind running. What would you like to ask? I'm gonna let you, either of you, take up one of the next one, but Ruth, you're on right now. Um, you already know Dean King. So I think, you know, objectivity, you're talking about its history and um, kind of this empirical method of storytelling that was, um, created in response to yellow journalism and kind of defeating and debunking sensationalism. Um, what we've seen over the past uh, several years and, and for marginalized journalists and underrepresented journalists in media, um, objectivity has often been weaponized, um, not in their benefit, but also objectivity was created by a white male and often heralds um, the white male perspective as a default, which has its own biases. And so we're really not asking uh, white male sports reporters if they're being objective when they're covering, you know, predominantly black sports leagues or NBA protests and things like that. Rather, we're taking black journalists off their beat. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, with respect to diversity in the newsroom and objectivity, um, do you think that, you know, white journalists have a responsibility to, to um, grapple with and cover these issues uh, regarding underrepresented communities, especially how they um, shift into systemic inequality and also, do you think their objectivity would be called into question in those instances if there were a right reporter um, writing these things? Well, of course, we, of course, everybody has an, we have an obligation. White journalists have an obligation to understand everybody. I think I talked about uh, the need to be really generous listeners to, to listen to everybody. Uh, and listening to marginalized communities is, is you know, at the top of, at the, top of the list. Uh, we want, you know, one of the things that, you know, one of the great lessons of the Catholic Church investigation is that you need to talk to people whose voices aren't being heard, uh, that they deserve to be heard, uh, and that the time had come for people to be heard was actually not the time had come, it was overdue to be heard. That The same is true for, for marginalized communities in the United States. So, um, you know, should, um, can that work be done by 
by white journalists? Yeah, I think that work can be done by white journalists. Will it be done by journalists of color as well? Yes, it should be done by journalists of color. I don't believe that you know we should uh, sort of segregate journalism that says that only blacks can cover blacks and only Latinos can cover Latinos and only uh, Jews can cover Jews and only Catholics can cover Catholics and only you know whatever. Uh, I don't think that that's a that's a great route for journalism. Some of the best journalism is done by people who are who are not part of that community, but they're really good listeners and they're really good writers and they're really good reporters. And if we have any faith in journalism, is that the that the tools of journalism, when properly when properly applied, uh, can uh, can bring understanding to uh, bring understanding to uh, subjects and to people and. And when they're not properly applied, they can do a lot of damage. But uh, when they are properly applied, um, anybody, we, people of any race and background, ethnicity and background, should be able to do should should be able to do it if they do it right. All right. Who would like to ask the next question in this group before I? Mary Slade, would you like to go? I did have another follow-up question. Go ahead, Mayor Slate. Um, so I was going to ask if you think there are any instances where a journalist cannot be completely objective, such that they're, they're a member of a certain community, such as like um, the transgender community, and they're covering a story that possibly like, affects their community. Do you think there are situations such as that where a journalist cannot be completely scientifically objective? Uh, yeah, I think there are, and that's why we have a lot of conflict of interest rules. Uh, and it's why when we see that journalists have expressed um, expressed uh, publicly, have expressed uh, their own views on a subject, we, we ask them not to, we, we are averse to having them cover that particular subject. So, um, uh, you know, we have a strict conflict of interest policy. And, um, and so there are any number of occasions where journalists simply can't be objective. And it's not just that they can't be objective, it's that they would not be perceived as being objective. And public perception is very important too because if it looks like we have preconceived notions about what, uh, you know, what stories should say, uh, then we don't, we, 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 we don't have a lot of credibility with readers. And, um, and credibility is our, is our currency. And if we don't have credibility, then nobody's gonna listen to us. There was a debate this summer, um, just to follow up on that morning, that um, in the protests in the street, the kind of emotion that uh, really we saw this summer, um, that, the perception would be if you saw, and I'll put it on television, but you see a black reporter covering it, they're not going to be objective, they're going to be connected, and the perception will be they can't cover it. And then the other side was, well, could you only be a white person covering what was going on in the street and be objective? So how did you deal with that as a newsroom? Uh, we have people of all races and ethnicities and backgrounds covering, uh, covering uh, the racial justice protests. Um, as I said, if you're a good reporter, you'll do a good job. Uh, we don't presume that because somebody is of a particular race or ethnicity or has a particular identity that somehow they're they're not permitted to cover a certain subject. We don't presume that presume that people who are you know are gay can't cover issues involving gays. We don't presume that. I mean, when I was at the way back when I was a reporter at the Miami Herald in the 1970s, I believe that they had a policy where they wouldn't. They actually had foreign bureaus at the time, and one of them was in in Jerusalem in Israel. Uh, and at the time, they initially they had a policy where they didn't send Jews to go cover uh, cover Israel because they felt they couldn't be objective about it. Um, fortunately, they changed that policy. And uh, but you know that's the same that's the same sort of um, I think bad uh, sort of wrongheaded thinking about how to assign how to assign people. Uh, the question is, are we being good journalists? Uh, not. Um, uh, is, does, is this person, you know, of a particular race or a particular ethnicity of a particular religion or a particular this or that and or particular identity? Uh, it's, is this a person who is adhering to the core principles of journalism or not? Uh, are we, are, are, for us, you know, we want to be, as I said before in the remarks, you know, our job is to be witnesses. Our job is to be independent. Our job is to be reporters. Our job is, you know, we do not see our job as being participants. Um, and to the extent that we, you know, we have views, yeah, sure, that's going to help. I mean, to, to some degree, that's going to inform our, our reporting. But we also have to recognize that at times our own preconceptions can, can actually get in the way. And we need to be able to sort of, in a way, regulate ourselves. Uh, and um, it's a discipline. And, uh, 
And fortunately, we have a lot of, you know, our staff at the Post, I think, can do that well. Um, and, um, you know, I would never want to get into this, into a situation where we say, you know, only Blacks can cover Blacks, only Latinos can cover Latinos, only Whites can cover Whites, only Jews can cover Jews, Catholics can cover Catholics, you know, you name it. Uh, or the opposite, or say that they can't because they, or, or make the assumption that Blacks can cover protests, you know, Black Lives Matter because they're Black. Uh, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. So the um, question is, is this person a good reporter? Will this, do, this person do a good job and uh, that adheres to journalistic principles? If the answer is yes, that person should cover that subject. I'm gonna to go to one in the audience right now because it plays a little off of this. Sophie um, out there says, in what ways has social media's ever increasing presence affected the pursuit of truth? And how can we use social media in a positive way that can align with foundational journalistic values like those you're talking about? Oh, well, certainly social media has led to the propagation of an enormous number of uh, falsehoods and, and conspiracy theories. Um, you know, uh, absolute lies, uh, deception, disinformation, misinformation can travel around the world and reach uh, millions of people in no time at all. Um, and in some ways, the more outrageous it is, the more likely it is to be spread. Uh, the more incendiary it is, the more uh, uh, conspiracy oriented it is, the more likely it is to be shared. That's a really scary prospect uh, because uh, um, there are a huge number of people who believe the most outrageous things. Uh, you look at the whole QAnon conspiracy theory and you know, there's a large percentage of the American public that believes that this sort of cabal of pedophiles who's uh, you know, basically running the US government and, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, and you wonder how is it that people can believe this and yet people do. Uh, and, and so you know, we're, in a, we're in a dangerous place when we as a society cannot, cannot come to an agreement on a common set of facts. I mean, as a society, we should debate things. We should debate them vigorously. People can have, should have different opinions. That's the whole idea behind a democracy is that we should be, you know, argue in a, in a, in a civil way. Uh, we all have different, people will have different opinions about what the appropriate policies are. But ultimately we have to work from a common set of facts. And if we can't even agree on, on a, a baseline set of facts, it's really hard to understand how we function as a society. We, we will live in completely parallel universes. Um, and we will have no, no prospect of understanding why anybody is saying anything. And um, that is a, that's, that's a scary prospect. The extent to which social media has helped? Well, less so, um, <laughs> I would say. Um, you know, I mean, I think the reality is that there, there are a lot of people who are quite expert in their field. Uh, sometimes they, they, they can't, they don't surface uh, in traditional media. Uh, we can fall back on the same so-called experts time and time again. Uh, but there are people out there who actually have some really significant insights and, and do significant research. And they now have the capacity to, uh, to uh, reach large numbers of people more directly. Uh, and that's a positive thing. The, the, the challenge is sorting out who is, who's a real expert and who's a, who's a fraud and um, who, who's pretending to be an expert. And, um, and so, you know, it's great that we can, you know, follow people on Twitter who have just a high level of expertise in certain subjects. Um, and we don't have to rely on mainstream media uh, intermediaries to determine for us who to, who to listen to and who should be heard, that we can listen to them directly. Uh, but we do have to do our work to find, to sift through it all, to, to figure out, is this person a genuine expert or is this person not? And I'm gonna to go to another one in the audience and I'm coming back to you, our, our group of four. So this is from Emma and a totally different one, Marty, and you're so good at the facts, we'll be interested in whether you wanna say, how do you manage your own mental and emotional physical health? when you're covering overwhelming traumatic stories. I mean, this has become a theme of it. How do you deal with your reporters who are seeing things that are, can be very disturbing? Right. Uh, well, you know, who said I manage my mental health very well? I don't know. <laughs> um, um, I think it's concern for our reporters. I, uh, um, you know, they've had to deal with, um, as I said, vilification by the administration, threats from the public, constant threats from the public where we've had to enhance our security. Well, they've been in, on the streets covering racial justice protests where 
um, you know, their well-being is at risk. Um, uh, they have had to cover uh, uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, again, their own personal health is at risk. Um, many of them are having to work from home uh, without, most of them are having to work from home um, without sort of the benefit of social interaction that we have in, in a newsroom. Uh, you know, we try to encourage people to take breaks. Um, people are not so good at that. Uh, we try to encourage people. We try to get as many people on Zoom to at least have conversations. We encourage our department heads to talk to their people regularly. Um, we certainly try to make sure that uh, we provide security uh, and safety for all the people on our staff. Um, and uh, we don't run a police force of our own. Uh, it can take time if somebody needs actual physical security. Uh, it can take a little bit of time to get somebody there. Uh, but we, um, um, you know, we, um, we want to be responsive when people, when people need our help. And, um, uh, but it is, a, it is a challenging time to, to be a journalist, that's for sure. And as you said, you don't go into it to be popular, but it's also hard to always be an enemy. John, um, I'm going to turn to you for your next question. Absolutely. Um, on the topic of covering tragic events, um, I was looking into the Pulitzer finalist project for breaking news um, by the Washington Post on the back-to-back -back shootings in El Paso and Dayton. And what struck me by uh, the project was the Post pulling in the statistics of mass shootings from the past 54 years in the nation and reporting on mass shootings as an epidemic in the country. And so with respect to that project, um, I was wondering how did you navigate choosing to report on the tragedy in that untraditional manner? I think we had just decided at that particular point, it was such a dramatic moment to have that, those back-to-back -back, uh, mass shootings. Uh, it was a shock to the country in a way that, I mean, every, every one of these mass shootings is a shock, um, but that was, a, that was bigger than most. And so uh, I felt, we felt, that was a moment where we really needed to, we needed to mark the moment. Uh, we needed to say that there's something really, uh, there's something really terrible that's, that's happened here. Um, that uh, we needed to produce a, a publication that, that recorded the names of all the people who had been shot in mass shootings, uh, who had been killed in mass shootings. And then there are plenty of other people who have been wounded. Um, and, and then there are all the, of course, there are all the uh, family members and friends who were, who were wounded in a different, in a different way. Uh, and that we needed to record that and uh, make a statement and, um, and remind people of just uh, what the price, the price that we pay. And so that's how it, that's how it came about. Is that good for you, John? Okay. Yes, so I believe Ruth said she has a follow-up. Okay, Ruth. Hello, hi. Um, so kind of going off of the theme of reporting on traumatic situations um, and very heightened situations as well, how do you personally exhibit tact and thoughtfulness when talking to sources and victims? I know that, um, you know, something that we talk about is speaking truth to power, and it's very different, um, you know, talking to a public official as opposed to someone who is of a um, unprotected status per se. And I know that you had supposedly talked Bob Woodward out of revealing Kavanaugh as a, as a source. Um, so kind of how do you decide what information to allow sources to, to have agency over? Well, just to address that this last statement of yours, that's actually not true. Uh, I know that that's appeared in the New York Times, but it's actually not true, just as a bunch of other things in there were not true. So uh, I never stepped in to stop Bob Woodward from publishing anything. Uh, he, actually, um, he actually came to me and said, I didn't know that he had a story. Uh, it's not like I rummaged through our computer system looking for stories uh, that people have. He came to me and said he had this story, he came into my office, he said he had this story, and he wanted to know what my opinion was, whether I, he should publish it or not. And I wasn't the only one he asked, there were other people he asked as well, other editors he asked. Um, and um, we told him that we didn't think he should. Um, um, and, um, and we had a discussion, not just me, but other people did as well. And ultimately, Bob agreed that he shouldn't. Uh, so this, this representation that I stepped in to stop Bob Woodward from publishing some explosive material about Brett Kavanaugh is just a complete fiction. Um, 
and uh, it didn't happen. Uh, and um, but if if a reporter asked me to, like Bob Woodward, uh, asked me, would you look at the story and give me your opinion as to whether I should publish this? I will look at the story and give him my opinion as to whether he should publish it. And uh, and he will ask other people as well. And then we will collectively give him our opinion. But ultimately, it was Bob's decision. You know, uh, Bob Bob was. Um, uh, it was a source for a source for a book that he wrote. He wrote it independent of the post. Um, and, uh, so it's his source, it's his book. It wasn't the Washington post and it's his decision what to do about a source. And so ultimately the call was his and we made clear the call is yours. Uh, do we think it's a wise thing for you to do? We don't think it's a wise thing for you to do. So that along with a bunch of other things in there, by the way, uh, was completely mischaracterized and uh, was an absolute falsehood. And that was the lead anecdote in that column that appeared in the New York Times. And it's completely false. Um, and I, now that I'm so absorbed with that question, I forgot what the rest of your question was. Yes. Um, so with respect to reporting on trauma, exhibiting tact and thoughtfulness when talking to sources and victims and knowing who to allow to have agency over a particular part of their story and, and how does that differ depending upon who you're talking to or does it not? Yeah, it does depend on who you're talking to. I mean, it is totally, as you said, it's totally different talking to a government official who's very practiced in talking to the press, uh, probably on the advice of a PR person and something like that, and somebody who's done it many times over, as opposed to talking to an individual who's never actually been exposed to a, uh, a reporter before. I mean, one of the things in the in the movie Spotlight, which I think accurately captures uh, sort of the reporting process, is just the difficulty of talking to victims of abuse, for example. Um, I mean, you need to you need to talk to them. You need them to be specific. You need them to go into detail. Uh, but it's traumatizing. It could be traumatizing for them to actually go into that level of detail. But in order for to us to do our jobs, uh, to verify the information, which we're always obligated to do, uh, we have to. Uh, we have to encourage them to open up. And, um, and so I always think that we should be treating ordinary people in a very different way uh, uh, than we do public officials or you know, corporate executives who also have PR advisors and things like that. And I think that we have to, uh, you know, we have these strict rules and rec on the record, off the record, things like that with public officials and they all know what the rules are. Um, uh, supposedly, uh, but um, uh, but with ordinary people, you know, we have to make sure they really understand uh, where we're coming from and what we're trying to achieve, and and we have to we have to be aware that uh, they don't they don't know these rules. They've never dealt with a journalist before. Uh, we need to, they're just ordinary human beings, and we need to we need to take that into account. And some people use the word exploit sometimes because a story always has to have this. The individual story to build it, maybe, and some some students worry that that um, journals go out and exploit. They find the victim, or they find that person who said, "How how do you describe it?" Because you do need to have the base. Well, you you know, I mean, I think that it's not. I think, look, I mean, I think we need to be open with people. We need to talk about what we're trying to achieve. We need to um, um, we need to build trust. And we need to honor the trust that people have shown on us when we, when we write our stories. And uh, we should not be engaging in any deception. Uh, um, and uh, people need to know what it is we're, we're trying to do. And when they, when they read a story, they should feel that, uh, in fact, we were honorable in, our, honorable in our dealings with them. Sophie, um, Sophia, how about I'm going to give you another chance before I go back to the audience. Um, I was wondering about how um, a news outlet being owned by somebody like um, Jeff Bezos, how that may affect what can or cannot be published or if it does affect that and kind of how you and your team manage that. Doesn't affect what we cover whatsoever. He does not get involved in our coverage uh, at all. Uh, he doesn't tell us what to write. He doesn't suggest what we write. He doesn't critique what we write. He doesn't criticize what we write. And that, that applies to our coverage of him and it applies to our coverage of Amazon. Um, so he just doesn't get involved in coverage. So 
I mean, he has to approve our budget. And if we want additional people, then, you know, to cover this or that, uh, obviously he has to approve that. Uh, fortunately, you know, he's been, he's been good about, um, really good about, um, you know, approving initiatives that have allowed us to expand, uh, particularly in the realm of investigative reporting. Uh, and he approved, by the way, expansion of resources and the coverage of technology um, so that we now have a big team in, San, in the Bay Area and San Francisco and the California. And, um, and many of those, the pieces that we write are not all that favorable about Amazon. In fact, they're quite critical. I think that our, the person who does most of our reviews rarely does he say anything nice about anything uh, regarding Amazon. And, and of course, then there are bigger issues on antitrust issues and privacy issues and uh, surveillance issues and things like that. And uh, workplace issues, all of that. We've covered it all. Uh, I've never heard a word from him about any of that coverage. Uh, and I don't expect that I ever will. Uh, he's been completely honorable um, um, with regard to our, with regard to our coverage, where he does come into play at the post is he um, he's very focused on our on our business uh, on our technology. So basically, our business uh, strategies over the long run uh, and the shorter term tactics that we use to get there. Uh, he knows a lot about tech. He's also very interested in our deployment of deployment of technology. Um, so that we better understand what our readers are most interested in, that we better understand what subscribers want from us, so that we uh, better know how to price our product, that we better know how to market our product, um, all of that. Um, and he's been, you know, it's, he's, it's, it's been a huge plus for us because he not only understands technology, which everybody focuses on, but he also understands uh, consumer behavior. I mean, after all, he does one run uh, one of the largest consumer businesses in the world. So, um, um, so, uh, and we're consumer business. So that's what, he, that's what he focuses on. And he has given us our independence, notwithstanding the fact that he has been uh, a target of incessant uh, attacks from the president of the United States, actually going back into the campaign in uh, 2016, uh, making threats uh, against, against, uh, him and, and Amazon because of the coverage of the Washington Post. Uh, and he has injected himself into, uh, he's tried to apply pressure against us by applying pressure against uh, our owner and, and Amazon, and it has not worked. And, um, and I think that that is a um, incredible statement about uh, how honorable our owner has been, that he has not interfered whatsoever in our coverage because his own his, his primary business has come under such uh, incessant attacks from, from the president of the United States. Um, I, I want you to know we're very proud that we now have figured out the other day that we have more than 20 um, graduates who are working at the Washington Post. Yes, you're hiring more, but we've got everyone from John Drescher to Kat Downsmoger, who is now on your masthead. So we're mm -hmm. proud of the kind of pipeline going there. And so the question from one of our students, Valerie, um, is asking, what advice would you give to an aspiring journalist? For while people, parents were saying, don't major in the journalism, there are no jobs. You've been hiring, but what would you tell them about this as a career and what should they be thinking about and doing? I'm sure none of your students have had parents tell them don't go into journalism. It can't possibly be true. Um, um, if journalism is your passion, you should go into it. Um, I mean, I think that um, journalism is changing. Um, dramatically. Um, that can be terrifying to people, but it also should make you aware that there are lots of new opportunities. Um, and um, storytelling is changing dramatically, and you're dealing with that at UNC, actually, and I think you're, you're doing a really great job of that. Uh, and that's why we have so many people from UNC at, at, at the Post, is that uh, you not only te are teaching the you know the traditional values, but teaching the new ways that stories are that that, that stories are being told, uh, using all the new tools that we have that make it more engaging and more effective, um, and um, and so storytelling is being transformed. And those people uh, who uh, understand both the traditional values but the non-traditional ways that that we are communicating uh, with the public. Um, have an opportunity to, to succeed and see their careers advance at a very rapid clip. And they have an opportunity to uh, even leapfrog uh, those 
journalists at, tradition, at, at other organizations who are either unwilling or unable to, to make the change, to, to, to adapt to and embrace the, the new technology that we have and the new, the new ways that we're performing journalism, practicing journalism. Um, you know, I used to say that, um, I've always said that, you know, we, we used to hire people from, um, who could uh, learn from us. Um, but now we really try to hire people who can teach us something that we don't know. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are coming out of uh, universities now who have really advanced skills and a lot of the new storytelling methods that, um, uh, that we need or that we may, we, we, may not have, we may not have those skills on staff or we may not have those skills in sufficient supply. Uh, so there are a lot of people who are coming out and are sometimes straight out of school, sometimes a, a couple of years out of school uh, who are being hired at the post. Uh, and they're playing central roles in, uh, in, in the evolution or what would more likely be called a revolution of the, at the Washington Post in terms of storytelling. So, um, uh, so I think there are a lot of opportunities actually. Um, I think we'll always have journalism in this country. As long as we have a democracy, we'll have journalism. So let's make sure to ensure that we have a democracy. Um, but as long as we have a democracy and, and uh, people are debating things and people want uh, and, and we don't just get our information from, um, from uh, government uh, and that we don't just have propaganda arms here, then uh, we will have journalistic institutions. Uh, there'll be all different types of journalistic institutions. Uh, some of them will be small, some of them will be big, some of them will be niche, some will be mass market, some will use different tools, some will use all the tools. Um, uh, but there will be a lot of opportunities. And so if, if this is a passion of yours, uh, if it's a passion, you're likely to be good at it. Um, and so um, if, you're, if it's your passion and you're likely to be good at it, you know, be sure to do it. Um, and so um, uh, you can't predict, I mean, this idea of parents predicting, not to contradict your parents, but this idea of parents uh, predicting like, what is the career of the future? The reality is that there are a lot of like, you know, people who are in, you know, uh, who are developers, people who, you know, may have lost their job because it's now been offshored to, uh, to countries over, you know, to countries overseas. Um, and you can't, you can't really predict. I mean, the legal profession is undergoing a huge transformation. I mean, my, you know, after I did journalism for a few years, my mother said, well, don't you want to be a lawyer like all your friends? Um, and, I said, no, I don't actually. And uh, I'm interested in the law, but I don't want to be a lawyer. And, um, uh, you know, because that was a profession that was presumed at the time to have sort of prestige uh, greater, than, greater than journalism at the time. And I think people should do what they, what brings them fulfillment, what brings them, I mean, I always wanted to go into a career that uh, was both, uh, would be consistently interesting and consistently meaningful. Uh, and, I believe that journalism offers that opportunity. And uh, it did when I got into the field. It has consistently since I've been in it for the now, what, 44 years. And, um, and I think it will in the future. That's a pretty good sales uh, pitch for the business of journalism, which um, I agree, if uh, democracy and journalism go together. And so I'm glad to see one, um, I spent 25 years in Washington, loved the Washington Post, and I was worried for a few years. It's great to see it doing so well. Marty Barron, you are a walking testament to the life of a journalist well-lived. Thank you very much for joining us. And Sophia and uh, Ruth and John and Mary Slate, thanks for representing all of our students so well. And to all the Media 101 students, and tell you, we had more than 220 people here for the, for the whole time. So Marty, you did a great job in keeping this class challenged. Thank Great. you. Matt. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thanks to all the panelists for the good questions and, um, and to the audience for your questions as well. And I wish you all the best. Excellent. We'll get you to Chapel Hill one of these days. Okay. I look forward Bye, to everyone. it. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.